Hello and welcome to this week's Talking Cods Warp. Well, actually, we're straying into the celluloid Cods Warp territory with this one, uh, with the guest I have on this week. The wonderful, the brilliant, and I do get mocked for using this word, but multi-talented. And I'm not going to say multi-talented threat because I got torn apart by listeners and a guest for saying that. But this man, this is a man of many, many wonderful talents. He is a voice actor extraordinaire, Mr. Heath Martin. Heath, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am fantastic, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to this. As have I, and thank you for coming on. Um, so, Heath, first question uh, I will ask you, the question that is always on my mind is, tell us a bit about yourself. Where does the Heath Martin story begin? Wow. Uh, <laughs> where does it begin? It begins on a dark desert highway, <laughs> approximately 1975. No, um, I was <laughs> I was born in the Pacific Northwest here in across the pond over here in the grand old us of a in a place called Corvallis, oregon which is home of the oregon state beavers college football team and other teams that they have but i'm a football guy so that's really all i pay attention to um (laughs) i moved from there to seattle and in pursuit of my musical endeavors uh, as you know and as your listeners Mm -hmm. are going to find out i i came up singing gospel and r&b music and spent the first 30 plus years of my life actively pursuing and gaining some good ground on that front. But what it did was it moved me around a lot and it gave me opportunity to see different, the way different people in different settings uh, handled themselves and how, and how performers could find a a platform. And uh, I've basically built everything off of that. Um, I'm a father, a coach, I'm a mentor, I'm a, an actor, I'm a, a dreamer, I'm a dream chaser. Um, man, <laughs> pretty much sums me up. So, if I can take you back to your childhood, one of the questions I would like to 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 delve into with people is to learn a bit about more uh, about what he did at school. Were you into because you mentioned sports team? So, were you into sports? I was. Yeah, absolutely. I was. Um, I've been into sports and music and theater since I could. Um, theater not as early on because it conflicted with some of my other activities, Mm -hmm. but American football, soccer, or your football, um, Mm -hmm. since, since I could walk, really, I've been playing, um, played all through high school, played semi-pro football and was in a car accident and broke my hips and then called my football career quits. Uh, but, uh, yeah, sports, athletics, drama, girls that I was into socializing. That was, (laughs) I, Mm -hmm. if socializing was a major, I would have been a straight A student. <laughs> and when you mentioned, I mean, it sounds very, very painful. Uh, you mentioned having a car crash, car incident. What was the recovery? Because did you say it affected your hips? So what was the recovery process on that? How long were you in hospital? Uh, yeah, it was the summer after my junior year in high school. I was uh, planning a visit to go to USC campus to check out their school and uh, possibly play football for them. And I, me and a couple of buddies of mine decided we'd take a little road trip and we would go stop at several spots between where we were living at, at the time, Olympia, Washington and Los Angeles and the surrounding areas. I, um, I, we were in Nephi, Utah, which is in the middle of the desert mm-hmm. because one of my buddies had relatives in Salt Lake that we were going to visit. Yes. He needed to take care of some business. So we went out that way and my buddy fell asleep driving the car. And I was laid back in my seat sleeping and I went out the rear windshield. Mm. Um, I went all the way out the rear windshield, broke my hips in seven places. My, uh, my pelvis was separated and I was asleep. So I didn't really feel a lot of that, but I do remember kind of like, you know, in a daze waking up to some of the local guys probably saved my life to be honest um some of the local guys that were out in that area i think we were near maybe an indian reservation um and they got us you know got us help they called the police and everything like that and i spent a month the initially i spent a month in the hospital they put what's called an external fixator in my hips which is looks like a bike rack um Mm -hmm. two two titanium posts that go into my pelvis on either side and then a rack that holds it all together. 
Uh, that was about a month in the hospital. When I got out of there, I got an infection in that when they removed that fixator and I had to go back in for three more weeks. Uh, and then when I was done with that, my, my physical therapist, my doctors and everyone didn't think that I would be able to function as far as move movement, uh, regularly again, definitely no running, no sports, nothing like that. So I was pretty bummed because like I said, I was going to visit USC and I had plans on playing college ball. But uh, as it turned out, life happened and I had to rethink my priorities. So I hit the gym really hard and the therapy really hard, got to the point where I could walk again in about after about four to six months and then got to the point where I could run again within the next uh, three to four months after that. And then the next fall, I played semi-pro football because I told the doctors, you're not going to tell me what I can't do. I love football. I'm going to play. But the truth of the matter is that it was so much harder for me to play at that point because it was harder to get in shape. It was harder to uh, to absorb hits, um, that type of thing. I was a fullback, so I absorbed a lot of hits, a lot of blocking, a lot of running up the middle of the gut. And it was it was brutal. And after a year of that, I decided to hang my cleats up and focus full time on music and art. Wow. I mean, it's quite amazing that you managed to get the the recovery that you did from that had to do so well, because for a lot of people, that will be the ultimate kind of setback where they just go, this is it. You know, the this is the end is nice. Sort of. I taught my mentality early on that my situation is not dictated by what other people tell me, what other, you know, other influences. It is solely dependent on what I'm capable of and the and the process that I go through to uh, to be great. Um, and I never realized the impact of that until just recently, uh, in, in my voiceover career, I utilize, there's doubt always in music and acting and whatever your endeavor is, especially artistic endeavors. You got to have thick skin cause you're going to get way more no's than you get yeses. Um, but my, I call myself stubborn, but I'm really just very tenacious and I'm, and I don't take no lightly. And I don't take it lying down. So if it's something that I've set my mind to and I and it's something that burns inside me, it's something I'm truly passionate about with the right justification. Uh, my why is always my children. Uh, then I believe I can do anything that I set my mind to and I don't let anything else stop me. And that's a very good mentality to have. So when you were growing up, was the specific aim before things changed that you were going to be in sports? Is that the career you wanted to pursue? I did. I wanted sports to pay for college, obviously, would be a great benefit and bonus. Uh, I wanted to play in the NFL. That was my dream as a child. But I also wanted to sell out concert arenas and go on tour and be the <laughs> the biggest R&B singer in the world. So uh, when I was young, I had to divide my time. It wasn't easy to have balance. It's still not easy to have balance as a grown man. But uh, the balance was important. But the two pursuits were always music and football until I couldn't. And then I shifted focus. And the, as we do, we evolve. And then yeah. I, that got to a point where I needed to shift my focus again. And, and here I am on this path. So I'm intrigued. I want to know, Heath, you obviously had that happen. That changed the perspective on the sporting career. How did you get into the music? Oh, wow. Music started from about the time I could form words. I've been entertaining my family at gatherings and functions, doing Michael Jackson impressions as a kid, uh, Prince impressions. Always was akin to the gospel, R&B, hip hop style of music. Uh, and and I would put on shows at, at family reunions. I'd put on just I'd put on my dad's like huge. He had these white penny loafer dress shoes that he had. <laughs> And they were probably about five sizes bigger than what my foot was, maybe even more. But I'd put them on and, and I'd stick my toe up in the front so the back was just all heel, just a blank, empty space in that shoe. And I'd moonwalk in them and I'd do, try to do my best <laughs> Michael Jackson impression. And I've always, as as far back as I can remember, I've been doing that. Uh, singing to girls at school, um, just showing off really for the most part. But I didn't start taking it seriously till I was about 13. And what was the thing that happened? You obviously said you started taking it seriously at 13. What was the, how did you, you get into the focus then of, of it becoming more of an important thing to you? The catalyst is a bit cliche, 
uh, in the music business, but it was my story as well. I had a, uh, a guy that I call my brother. We weren't related, but it was my brother basically, uh, mm -hmm. it was a hip hop artist and he was doing a record and he wanted me to sing background on it. Cause he, you know, he knew I could sing. I was 13. I had to talk to my mom and say, Hey, he wants to, he wants me to come out to Lake Tahoe and go to the studio and record this bit and make sure everything was, everyone was good with it. Uh, stepped foot in the studio the first time when I was 13 years old and fell in love with the process, fell in love with the engineering process of it, even though I never got into that side artistically because it's more of a math, you know, it's, it's uh, one side of your brain thinks about the, you know, the analytics, the math, the everything. And the other side is the artistic side. I have the artistic side on both sides of my brain. I just, you know, the, the tedious production and engineering and stuff like that. I, I can only do so much. Uh, I, I learned as much as I needed to get by enough that I needed to send my vocal tracks off to someone to do the rest of the work, to, to, to mix it into the, to the music, to make the music. Um, so I don't produce music or anything like that, but I do arrange and write. But, mm -hmm. um, I knew as soon as I stepped in that studio, I was like, man, this is the life I want. I didn't know exactly what, but I knew that the, based on the reaction that I got from the vocal performance, that it was probably going to be on the, on the line of, uh, of the voice thing. Music, I mean, this being a singer and, and performing, performing artist. Going back, I'm always interested to know people who work in the entertainment field. What was the, cause you said you always had to speak to your mother about it. Uh, what was your, the, the family reaction when you were saying, this is something I wanted to pursue. And it's a question I'm going to ask you again when it comes to, if I could answer it now for both, what's yeah. the reaction from the family when you say, I want to look at music as a career and then, going i want to look at voice over and acting as a career is it because you always generally hear of like this response from family members of are you sure are you sure you want to do this you know yeah, have yeah. something to fall back on you always hear that kind of story right i think if if my family um if any of them were entertainers then they might give you the are you sure speech because that's the speech i gave my kids when they wanted to do music I, hey are you sure i mean it's a real commitment it's not just a you know you can do it as a hobby if you want to, but if you want to get serious about it, it's a whole other ball game. My um my support system has always been pretty good. I was adopted. Me, my brother, my sister, and I. Uh, I'm sorry, my brother, my sister, and I were all adopted when our mother was was killed when we were little, and we were adopted by our grandfather and his wife. But it was his wife's idea, so my grandmother, who wasn't blood related at all, had a more vested interest in us three kids than our own flesh and blood did at the time. So that's another story for another day. But she raised us and kept us to keep us together and um, always very supportive. Whenever I wanted to do, I, I went to Chicago when I was, uh, how old was I, 14 and spent a good four months out there in the big city doing stuff. I've been all over pursuing music, California, Atlanta, New York. And she was always very supportive of that. We didn't have a lot of money, so I had to, you know, do construction, odd jobs and save money and family had to help out when they could and this type of thing. But they knew that it was something I was passionate about. And if it was something that could be done, we did it. Uh, that being said, well, my biggest supporter of all time is my big brother. He has always, always been my number one fan, my number one supporter. Uh, when I've need to sleep on a couch, he's been there, uh, just the whole, the whole package. Right. Um, but you know, so it was easy pre exiting school. So when I was still young enough to be able to do what I needed to do and have the family support that, but I got married right out of high school. And when, when I got out of high school and got married, that changed everything. It put like the brakes on all of my artistic endeavors because, you know, my wife wasn't keen on me traveling about the country or, you know, basically pursuing this lifestyle because it includes, you know, long nights, at clubs and wherever, you know, doing the marketing and the networking and the things that are required. And I was young and I didn't, I didn't know how to balance. Um, and I, you'll hear me talk about balance a lot because it's one of the most important things that an artist can have, uh, and balance in professional and, and personal lives. But that marriage was short lived because there was no support there. Um, and I'm, I'm a person that if I feel, if I'm not being supported in the in the endeavors that I have and the talent that I have and the only meal ticket that I have to provide the situation, like, I mean, 
I, I feel trapped and I, you know, I got to get out of that situation. But um, I was also young and didn't really know how to react to it, but, and would have done things differently because I have my three eldest kids were from that relationship and I wouldn't mm-hmm. change that for the world. But if I could go back and be more balanced and be more available to my kids, even though it wasn't working out with their mom, I would have done that all different. Um, I'm trying to make up for that now. And I have been for the past you know, 30 years or so, <laughs> no, 20 years, whatever it's been. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not easy. And if you're not there in the formidable times, and I wasn't there because I was pushed away and wasn't allowed to be there. Like I literally was not granted opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I wanted to see the kids, they were at church camp or they were at basketball camp or they were always doing something else. And so there was conflict there. Um, that I'm still to this day work very hard at resolving. Mm-hmm. Um, and then where were we? What were we talking about again? <laughs> you're talking about it's all right. It's all right. I, uh, I was getting mesmerized in what you're telling me anyway, but I have remembered it was talking about basically the, the positive, uh, well, not, the not support so much just the positive, but the support system you get from sort of family for doing it. Yeah. Obviously there, there is always the concern you hear, as I said, you hear a lot from family is this, the right so what decision I, to make. Right. What I learned from that first situation musically was that next time I go into a relationship or anything, I'm going to let let it be known right up front. This is a part of who I am. This is a part of who you fell in love with. This is a part of the package. I am. I pursue the art. That's what I do. Yes, I hold down other jobs to pay my bills in the meantime, et cetera. I did that for years, worked odd jobs, uh, managed pizza places, drove, did it, was a delivery driver for a time, um, moved freight, all kinds of regular jobs just Mm. to, so no one could say, Hey, you're not, you know, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. Yeah. So, so, so it was basically like I worked two full-time jobs and I still do to this day. So nothing has changed, but it was like, I would work a full job. And then in my off time, I would work on my, on my passions. Hmm. And I did that for years. And then I, uh, um, somewhere in between there, I, I was working with the late great Aliyah and, and black ground hmm. records. And when I was, and I'm still friends and family with some of those guys to this day, there was a group on the label called Outsiders for Life, who I sang some backgrounds for, grew up with a couple of them, and uh, just love those guys. And we, uh, you know, they were bringing me into the fold. So that was my first kind of major label experience. And I had been pursuing it, you know, my whole life. So um, that was great. And then I did a lot of independent stuff after that. I did some work with the with the R&B legend group H-Town and Jodeci and Silk and Shy and a, a lot of the big R&B groups of the 90s, um, kind of after the fact, like in the early 2000s. And, uh, and, you know, just for whatever reason, you know, stuff doesn't materialize. Early on it was they didn't know how to market me because I was a white kid that sang R&B music and, you know, they didn't. They just didn't know how to place me. Everyone wanted me to be like John B. or or uh, Justin Timberlake later, but I was a totally different artist. I was like, uh, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with the American artist Dave Hollister, who was the lead singer for Black Street in the '90s. He, um, I, I was more that style, more the gritty street, gospely, urban R&B, not pop contemporary like the other white R&B artists at the time were. So they had no idea how to package me. Then it was, I was too overweight or I was too, you know, it was just, it was like that my whole career. It got to the point and, and this will kick us into the voice acting where five years ago, I, I just, I had to stop. I had an album out. Uh, It's still out. It's on my website, heathmartinvo.com under the, my music page. Uh, And, and for music, I go by Anthony Martin, which is my middle name and my last name. Anthony Martin AM was produced and released in 2017, 2018. And, um, and after that, it's been straight, strict voiceover ever since. Now I still make music, but now I make music for me. I'm not making it to, for any other reason. I'm not making it to, to be signed. I'm not making it to please anyone. I'm literally making it just so that I can itch my musical, you know, I mean, so I can scratch my musical itch. Mm -hmm. That's it. But five years ago, I was I was depressed. My album wasn't doing anything. Uh, my my uh, my music wasn't doing much. I was 
preparing to perform uh, with some big names at a theater here, here locally um, off of the new album. And I was working with uh, Case, who did Missing You, and who was uh, Life Jennings. Uh, must be nice. So a lot of a lot of really popular, especially in the early 2000s, R&B singers, Jagged Edge, stuff like that. And I was preparing for this show and I did the show and I got this great response. I got this standing O. Everyone at the theater was happy to see a local kid on the stage. I mean, I was a grown man, but, you know, I was like 30 something. I know what whatever. you mean. I know what you yeah. mean. Yeah. <laughs> so but they were, they were happy to see, you know, a local guy doing this thing. And I thought it was going to maybe garner some some follow up, but nothing ever came of it. So I started getting depressed and and I was um I was in a bad place there for a long time and I uh even even went so far as to needing a creative outlet so bad that I built a uh a Batman costume for a cosplay type thing to go to comic it wasn't to go to comic con initially it was just to be creative but I'd never done anything like that before I made a whole styrofoam costume and I'll send you a picture and uh Oh, I don't know how do, you do because we love the, the whole one of the things the, from the, the uh, visual effects. Who, <laughs> who, well, one of the people who's on uh, ju- there's, be, just one thing to say, Gemma and Joanne, who I co host with, apologize for not being able to make this episode. Uh, they're both a bit under the weather, but Joanne is a mm. cosplay, it's one of the things she does. So, anything to do with nice. cosplay and going to stuff like that, you, you've got our attention, Heath. Where I will Sit. love to see that. Absolutely. And send her my well wishes, please. I'm sorry that I missed her as well. I um so I built the costume and went to Comic Con. Um and I met the guy who created the design for the costume. So it was a really good experience. But it wasn't it was just like a, a flash experience. So it was it was a quick a, a quick feeling of of acknowledgement of 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 uh, art artistic I don't know, uh, accomplishment. But then it was done. And now what am I going to do? I didn't want to yeah. spend the hours and hours and hours that it took to build that. So I, I said, what else can I do? My wife uh, said, hey, have you ever thought about voice acting? This was my second wife now. And I'd been married for a while at this point. Um, and I said, no, I'd never thought about it, but that is a good idea. I'll look into it. And I started looking into it. And one thing led to another. One mentor led to another. One mm-hmm. great open door led to another. And five years later, I have multiple agents. I'm working in every genre that I ever wanted. Movie trailer, uh, promo, commercial, animation, video game, uh, audiobook narration. Whatever I want to do, I'm doing. And I can be anyone or anything that I want to be in music. I had to fit into a certain little box like, okay, you, you got to be a little bit more pop. You got to be a little thinner. You got to be a little bit more like this person. You got to be a little bit, you know, it was all one constant hurdle after another. When am I, when am I just me going to be good enough for you? When are you going to accept me for the, for who I am, for the artist that I am? And I never got that acceptance. Never. Not across the board. I got it in small batches, but I'd never got it across the board. So in voice acting, I was afforded the opportunity to be a beast, to be a monster, to be a demon, to be a baby, to be a tree, to be a creature, to be a soldier, to be a superhero, to be a villain, to be a Sith, to be a, you know, every anything Mm -hmm. that I can imagine I can be. And I I never had that opportunity as a as an R&B singer. Never had the opportunity to just be me and different shades of myself because every character that I portray is just another version of me, right? So from the Mm -hmm. darkest, most defile, uh, wanting to take over the galaxy from my Lord Tirhar, the dark Lord of the Sith that I play on a Knights of the Old Republic Resurgence podcast to, uh, to a supervillain, to a, to roadblock that I play in American Kintsugi, who's based on a, a fighter pilot that gets shot down and just gets all blown up and nasty and gets inundated with technology and stuff to where it corrupts his mind and now and now he's a bad guy and all he does is he walks <laughs> around and causes trouble <laughs> hey what are you doing over there you got oh you got something to say to me big guy you got something to say to me tough guy 
You know, so I so that's that's Roadblock, <laughs> and I love him. But if I'm Lord Tihar, I'm darker and I'm more sinister. <laughs> Ooh, the force is strong with this one. But I love what I do. I love being able to wake up every day, and whether it's a, a whether it's a a script that I'm getting from my client, my partners in India that are asking me to do a trailer book read for a, a do it like a it's like a movie trailer, but for an audio book. So say say I'm doing Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. and 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 the brief is like. Sherlock Holmes and Watson look into the case further. So it'll be like just some some narration, but then there'll be times when I'll be able to go next time on Podcast FM. You know, and I'll get to put my trailer voice on and I'll get mm. to use these different these different shades and colors of everything that I am. And I never had that in any other genre of entertainment. Never. That's why I'm never going anywhere cuz <laughs> this is great, man. <laughs> It's, uh, I mean, it's wonderful just for me to hear your different, the different voices and styles you can do, and the, the acting and the work, and it will be the same for the listeners. But I'm going, I'm going to take you back with a question, Heath. I'm going to send you back in time on this one. When I've been doing a bit of research into you, I want to know about the Act One Theatre Group that you're part of. Which mm. Was that 2017? Mm. If you could tell me a bit about that. Absolutely. So let's go back a little bit deeper. When I made the decision that I really wanted to become an actor and I wanted to know what it took. Like all my life, when I watch movies, I'm more interested in the behind the scenes. So I'll get the DVDs and go straight to the featurettes. I want to see how it's made. I want to see what the actor's process is. I want to, exactly I want to learn. Same. Yeah, yeah. I want to learn the behind the scenes because that's how I get in touch with how it's made. How how do I bring my authentic self to that scenario? So when I was uh, uh, so in about 2016 or so. I had a mentor. I still have a mentor, a mentor, a friend, a brother. His name is Milan Rivera. He's a fantastic actor. He's got a deep voice like me. He's, he comes from music like I do. He was signed to Quincy Jones back in the day on Q Records. Um, I think it was Quest maybe at the time. But uh, I love him. And he, he, he kind of led the way for me to get into this. He said, hey, you know, it's great that you want it. You have all these passions and you want to do these things and you've got the talent to do it. But you need direction. You need to find your tribe. You need to get on stage. You need to put it into practical use. So find a, a community theater. Find someone that will allow you the space to expand your uh, your knowledge and your abilities. Um, I looked around for a local theater in my area. And the first one that I contacted, they were... Uh, <laughs> they're pretty rude, <laughs> pretty rude. They were very <laughs> exclusive in the club that they, you know, they had their people and that was that. Right. Right. So I kept looking and uh, and it wasn't just for me. It was for me and my daughter. My my youngest daughter wanted to get into acting as well. And I wanted to, something that we could do together. You know, I coached my son in football and I wanted to be able to pass on this to, to another child. I have five, by the way, three from my first marriage, two that are still living at home. Um, so I found Act One Theater Group, and they're local. They're probably 30 minutes away from where my home is. And I reached out to them, and they couldn't have been more accepting and more kind and more open. They were lovely. I mean, they were they were like voice acting community. And the voice acting community is unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so the director of Act One Theater Group, uh, Petra Carr, is an amazing, amazing director and friend. And she brought me in and 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 she let me audition for all these roles. And it got to the point where they're like, you know, you don't even have to audition. This is the role we see you in. And they just give me the role right out of the gate. Uh, but that was about three plays in. So the first thing that I auditioned for was a a play called Sylvia, which is an off-Broadway play that stars Matthew Broderick on the Broadway version. And uh, I played Greg. I played Matthew Broderick's part. And it's uh, it's the guy. It's it's the it's actually the only uh, it might be the only protagonist I ever played on stage because I'm such a I'm a booming presence. So I always play the villain. 
always, almost, almost always. <laughs> but uh, so like, so f- I played Greg and Sylvia where he's got like this weird relationship with this stray dog that he brings home. And then he has, it causes issues with his wife and it's a great play and it was beautiful and it was heart and I got to sing a little. Um, and that opened my eyes to a whole new world of the, of musical theater. The next play I did was, uh, I believe the next play I did was Urine Town, where I play Mr. Cladwell, the uh, the the vile, sinister, over <laughs> like landlord of Urine Town, <laughs> who is just an <laughs> evil dude, and I loved it. I loved him. I loved every part of it. The greatest thing about Urine Town was this was the first time ever in the history of my life that I had got to be on stage with one of my children. So my youngest daughter, who I was telling you I wanted to find a, a place yeah, for yeah. as well, she came on with me, and we were both in the play. And we did two more plays together after that. Um, but we were both in the play, and it was amazing. And it was I'll, it was probably one of the greatest artistic uh, experiences of my life, just being able to perform with her, go to rehearsals with her, uh, go over the material outside of rehearsal with her, read, read lines together. It was just awesome, right? Um then I went on to do uh, The Drowsy Chaperone, where I played another scumbag. I played Mr. Feldzig, the producer of the show, uh, who is the main villain, <laughs> the main antagonist again. And uh, see a common theme here? Oh, wait a minute. Well, I, did the uh, Chris- I was going to say, there does seem to be a theme coming, but they do say playing the villain is more fun than playing the, the, it's the, so the much, hero. It's so true. Well, the interesting thing I found, I was talking about to somebody about this recently, is that when I was younger, well, we'll take when I was really young, I was into Transformers. Mm, and yes. Autobots, Transform. Yep. Yeah, I always liked the Autobots. And then as I've become an adult, and I still will admit I die, I will still watch bits of Transformers things, I find the villains far more interesting. The Decepticons yes. are far greater. Prime! Yeah. Yes, I love oh, me great. some Megatron. I love Megatron. He's oh, the, yeah. one of, Megatron and Starscream are two of the greatest villains of all time. They remind me a lot of Cobra Commander and Destro, but kind of reverse because Cobra Commander is more whiny and Destro is mm-hmm. more strong, whereas Megatron is strong and Starscream is whiny. Both played well, by course. played played brilliantly, of course. Yeah. Um, Frank Welker same, and but it was the same Charlie guy, Adler. wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Same guy yeah. in the original. Yeah. Who did? That's right. Starscream and Cobra Commander. Yes, sir. And I, yeah, I, I've always kind of gravitated. My favorite character of any, any genre of all time is Darth Vader. He's got the greatest story arc of any villain yeah. or any, uh, any character in general, right? He's powerful. He's big. He's menacing. He's mysterious. He is everything you want in a character and in a villain and in a, mm. a, a villain that has a redemption arc. Right. So he's there's heart there. There's there's a redeeming quality, even though he killed younglings. Yes, people, I said it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But we didn't have that dream squashed until the prequels. So let's be fair. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) But I've always gravitated to them because in their story, they are the hero. Right. They're not doing this just because. Uh, on a whim, most times. Now, sometimes you have your mustache twirling villains. Yeah, I'll get you yet. <laughs> You've got those guys that are only, they only have one purpose, right? But these these good villains that are well written and well fleshed out, these guys ha- believe that they're the hero. Absolutely. He, be- he he truly believed that he could find a way to bring his love back to life, which engulfed him even further into the dark side, trying to mm-hmm. find a way, which made him more mechanical and more evil. And mo- you know what I mean? So it's like there's layers and layers and layers to unwrap. And if you get an opportunity to play a villain long enough, I've been playing Lord Tirhar on the on the uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic Resurgence podcast long enough to where I'm about what are we uh episode 10 i think yeah episode 10 uh i'm really getting to know this guy like i really Mm -hmm. understand his motivation and his what his desire is and what his needs are and where his power lies okay so i used to think that the villain had or the the power was in being loud and bolsterous but it's in the quietness Mm -hmm. that's the scariest stuff so if 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 I can take a guy that nor- back in the day I would have played, oh, ha, 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 you know, big and menacing <laughs> and make him more sinister, 
quiet, and maybe even a little scheming. <laughs> and he always likes to laugh, <laughs> you know, and just have so much fun with them, man. The evil chuckle is always one of the in- the inherent things you hear. Some sort Absolutely. of laugh. Absolutely. Mark guy, Hamill's the, Joker the has guy. some of the oh, best God. laughing ever. Oh, my God. Yeah. Anyone. <laughs> Love it. Yes. It's, I mean, the Joker, his take on the Joker is probably, it is, I think, there within my all-time favorite Jokers. Ever. Absol- I- absolutely. Without a doubt. He is definitely, as far as, you know, and I love what Joaquin did. I love what Heath did. Uh, but as far as overall, because the Joker's basically got split personality. So he comes mm-hmm. different every delivery, every time. He, he might be a little playful. <laughs> oh, oh, Harley, don't be so drunk. You know, or he could be really angry. I don't, you know, it's just such yeah. a beautiful array of, uh, uh, of just good mm, squishy goodness it's just dripping with excellence i love the performance so much but he's written so well mm. that's we can't do anything if the writing is whack like if the writing isn't pretty stellar yeah we can bring something to it but we explore based on how good the writing is so if the writing is 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 uh descriptive and you know exactly what the intention is and what your scene partner is going to do in voice acting, that's a little difficult if we're recording remotely, but that's a different story. And I digress. But you can get a feel for it in a table read and then you can base your performance off of that. It's just so much to explore. I mean, it's still interesting. Just going back to our comment on things like Mark Hamill with uh, playing the Joker. I still maintain the Mask of the Phantasm film, the Batman film. With oh, the so good. Best. So situation. Oh, I mean, I can watch that again and again and again. It it almost feels like you're not watching a superhero story, which I know may sound strange, but the integral no. arc of that is, is love and loss for the characters it really is. in it. And it's, it's yeah, it's, it's beautifully written and it's beautifully animated and it's beautifully voiced. Um, mm-hmm. I had really high hopes for the Killing Joke because I'm a huge fan of the Killing Joke comic, mm-hmm. but they went yeah. really, really artsy with the with the movie. And it wasn't, I mean, you know, it had Mark and it had uh, Kevin Conroy and it had all the players. It had all the pieces that I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be on the level of the mask of the phantasm, but I would, you know, because I had those expectations in the, in the moment, I was a little disappointed, but upon rewatching it a few times, I love it for what it is. But, uh, the mask of the phantasm is one of the best animated films I've ever seen of yeah. any of any hero or or villain dynamic duo you know we've digressed slightly but i'm loving it we're discussing interesting fun topic you were talking about when you were working in the theater you had the wonderful experience of being able to work on the stage with your daughter uh so you would you were working with that one for a while how, how did that progress and when did it sort of come to end or is it something you still you still work with them you're right. Yeah, I didn't finish the story because it's a bit painful. When um we we were making moves and and doing plays up until the pandemic hit, and right. then when when COVID happened, um it shut down for a while. And within that stretch of time, our wonderfully amazing director Peter uh got COVID and passed away, and uh, so we never we never put it back together. It, it actually auctioned off as a uh, as a not-for-profit um, establishment, and and it's not even it doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so that's that's touchy and that's sad. Mm-hmm. But around the same time that all that happened, the voice acting was picking up, and I could devote. You know, I I didn't really have time to be honest. Uh, in retrospect, to do both. Uh, so so things always happen for a reason and they happen the way they're supposed to happen. My job is to be ready when opportunity presents itself or when a hurdle sh- comes up that I need to try to get over. That's my that's my job. My job is to be versatile enough and well prepared enough to adjust, react and keep moving forward. Otherwise, you just you, you fade, die, go away, whatever. And uh, I'm not ready to do that. So how did you get into the whole voiceover a few it's, minutes? Yeah, it's a it's a very <laughs> still complex. Still one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complex answer because uh, you know every journey is different, every actor's journey is different, everyone's origin story is different. 
Mine was I was an overzealous R&B singer that thought I could reach every single A-list voice actor in the world, get my word, my name out there, and all of a sudden I'd be the next sensation. That was just my mentality coming in because that's the mentality you have to have in music. It's it's very ego driven and ego based. Now I'm a I'm a grateful person, I'm a humble person and I'm a a person that lives with gratitude. But I didn't know what that meant prior to getting into voiceover full time. Uh, I approached people like Bob Bergen, who has since become a great friend and mentor to me. Uh, I approached people like Chuck Duran, who is the greatest demo producer in all of voice acting um, and a wonderful musician. And now he's a mentor and a friend. I approached Steve Bloom, who is my mentor, my coach, my main, like my main conduit, like my lightning rod in voice acting is Steve Bloom, because when I decided to make a conscious effort to look into the into the into the art uh i looked up people that were in my wheelhouse people that i could learn from i felt like i didn't feel like i could learn from someone that was a high tenor voice because they don't know how to uh uh, hold back and my biggest issue to this day even is getting out of my own way not being bigger than the part that i need to play because i'm such a big personality i'm such a, a a boisterous loud booming you know i'm a bass baritone right yeah. so so it, if i was going to learn from james arnold taylor which i do and i and i learn a lot from him and his and his uh video his vlogs and whatnot but he's a fantastic actor but our our wheelhouses are totally different ends of the spectrum yeah. right he doesn't do low and i don't really do high unless i'm doing like a falsetto like a kid character or something like that or something you know if i gotta kind of you know talk like this it's okay if for, for a little while and it gets old man this is my oh my gosh you know what i mean or it, <laughs> <laughs> So if I do a baby in the middle of a restaurant, it's funny and it's cool and it's weird that I can do that at my it's also my regular <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, somebody shut that baby up! But uh, <laughs> but it's that's not where I live. I don't live in that. I can do char- I've got range, so I can do characters up there. I I, I got a guy that's um you know he's kind of up here. He's got kind of a nasally thing. East Coast, maybe a little Jewish. I don't know, but um you know he he always has fun and he's and he's kind of a, he's he's like an old man but a womanizer. You know, I've got characters all throughout the spectrum, but my my baseline, my bread and butter is down here this is my bread and butter i like doing movie trailers you know what i mean so it's like coming soon you and don la fontaine would have been the perfect kind of mix. man i i regret so much that i'd never got a chance to meet him what a phenomenal legend in this in this business he was amazing wasn't he you hear his yes yes amazing Yes. But so to get back on subject, I found Steve and he played the voice of Wolverine and Spike. Yeah. 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 So Wolverine was right up my alley. Hey, bub, you know, he's he, he's a tough guy and he's kind of right in here, isn't he? He's a uh, uh, hey, Professor X. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's just kind of gruff and I love it. That's kind of my wheelhouse. So I looked into him and I saw that he was doing classes so i signed up and five years in i'm he's i'm still his number one fan we're friends he's my mentor he's my teacher uh most of what i know of how to be a man in this business i get from him Mm. uh you you know i've i have mentors like joe cipriano who's the voice of fox and and abc and so many Man, so many events, uh, you know, the Olympics or whatever. You hear his voice on, um, you hear his voice doing The Simpsons all the time. He's the voice of The Simpsons. Um, James Arnold Taylor does some of those too. But I approached Joe Cipriano and I did I, with the same effect that I did everyone else. I was like, hey, I'm brand new, but I'm awesome. What are you going to do with me? You know, that's obviously, <laughs> it's obviously paraphrasing, but that was kind of the attitude I had coming in. And he he shut me down, man. He was like, uh, yeah, so <laughs> you're you're green 
I mean, yeah, you've got a you've got a nice tone, but you have no idea what you're doing. You might be a fantastic musical performer, but you don't know squat about this business. So go learn about the business. Come back to me in six months when you've learned something. I was fucking dis- I was devastated. I was destroyed. Understandably, though. Understandably. I, was, I was sitting in a pool of my own excrement. It was terrible. <laughs> That's not quite literal, but, you know, um, so I did one better. I waited a year. I got my shit together proverbially. I got a demo. I got my chops got way up. I got really, really good at certain stuff that I do. And I reached back out to him a year later and I showed him uh, something and he said, now you get it. That's it, right? That read was fantastic. And this coming from one of my heroes in this business. When it comes to promo, there's there's two pe- three people that I love in this business. Four. Mark Ryder, who's doing all the Spider-Man stuff, all the Doctor Strange stuff, all the Shark Week stuff. He's, his voice is everywhere right now. That's one of my mentors and one of my coaches. Um, Joe Cipriano, who, I was, who I've been talking about, who's mm-hmm. literally a legend, one of the best to ever do it. He used to pal around with Don LaFontaine and it's just he's a, he's a. Um, look him up. He's so amazing. <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> I'm telling your viewers, look him up or your listeners, look him up. He's amazing. Um, and he shut me down and I needed that. I needed that kick in the yeah. ass. I needed someone <laughs> to tell me, Hey kid, you're good, but you ain't that good. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Hey, pick your mouthpiece up, put it back in your mouth and start <laughs> swinging again. What are you? What are you new? Yeah, I'm new. I'm new, Joe. I am brand new. <laughs> But thank you for destroy. If I was a weaker man, if I hadn't spent 30 years chasing a musical dream, that probably would have devastated me right mm-hmm. out of the game. I mean, it probably would have. But my skin is thick. I've been doing this stuff for my whole life. So nothing anyone says is going to phase me. We talked about that mentality a little earlier. Um, so I came back to him in a year. I did a spot. I did a uh, <laughs> I did a. I did my rendition of a spot that was like this. With precise control at every turn, the intelligent CTSV sedan is designed to perform. Anyone can build a car, but only we can build a Cadillac. So I did that spot. I sent I sent it. Thank you. I sent it to him along with my commercial demo produced by Chuck Duran, the amazing, the magnificent, the one and only. And he was he was just over the over the moon ecstatic and i've you know i've had conversations with him several times since and it's just been all positive and i tell him every time i talk to him i said man you know you you're responsible for me being where i am if it wasn't for that pushback that you gave me it wouldn't have given me the grit and the fight as an athlete that's all i know how to do to to adversity all i know how to do is try to get better so uh, when you gave me that little nudge it made me try to be great not just, oh, this dude can sing, so he must be able to do voice acting also. He's got a good voice, so he should be able to do this. No, it's way more than that. It's voice acting. Acting is in quotations, not the voice, mm-hmm. right? Because it's it's never about us. It's about what we bring to the project. It's about the overall collaboration. So once I realized that and started getting out of my own way, Things turned around for me. I picked up my first agent, which was a local agent here in Seattle, which is ZTA or uh, it it was it was um, Tiffany Talon at the time. But then it was it traded hands. And I went with the with the the guys that were my agents, uh, Bob and them. So then it became ZTA uh, ZTA. And that was my first my first agent. And they'd send me auditions and I booked some. I didn't book some. It's just the nature of the business. Right. And then uh, about maybe a year after I signed with ZTA, I signed with Lisa Ristow out at Impressive Talent out of Maryland. And that was based on my, I signed with ZTA pre-demo actually. So that was before I even had a demo. I signed with Impressive after I got my demo. Um, And I've been doing, I'm doing jobs for them right now as we speak. I mean, we work together all the time. Then it wasn't until uh, just this past, a few months ago that I signed with my two big dog agents, one, Dean Panero Talent, which is one of the biggest agents in the business. He's a he's an icon in the voiceover business when it comes to agents. And he he founded DPN, which is one of the biggest agencies. And then he kind of branched off and went solo. Um, 
he has been welcoming and warming to me ever since our first conversation. And that relationship has been fantastic. I audition for him almost every day whenever we get something. And then like the two days after I signed with Dean Pinero, I signed with my San Francisco agent, which is J.E.T. And they, um, you know, I mean, I'm on rosters with people like Yuri Lowenthal and James Arnold Taylor, like I said, um, Sam Regal, J.P. Karliak, uh, I mean, t- uh, Tara Platt, all these actors that are in major projects. And I'm getting auditions from Lucas. And I'm getting auditions from Disney and Nickelodeon and and, you know. All of these auditions that I never had access to before, but it's all part of the growing process. Two years ago, I wasn't where I am today. Two years from now, I won't be where I am today, you know, and but if you understand that there's tears to it and not to be overwhelmed by the details, because there's so much to accomplish. There's so much to get done. There's equipment. There's I got to learn how to be a producer, an editor, a director. I got to learn how to audition. I got to learn how to audition for separate genres. Everything is totally different. But it's all all character stuff. Right. So even in commercial work like that car spot I just did, Mm -hmm. that was me. It was my voice, but it's still a character. When you're talking about luxury automotive, you're talking about something that's soothing, something that makes you feel at home. You know what I mean? So there's certain ways to attack every genre of the business. And I had to learn those. I'm always learning that. I'm still learning that. I do dialect training for characters. I've been doing that for a long time. As a musician, the stuff comes to me naturally because I can mimic and I can I can understand it and take it in and go, OK, I, I know how to add this affectation or this or that or whatever. But you have to study it to know that you're always doing it correctly. And when I do if I do a Cockney. I don't want to offend anyone. I want it to be spot. I want it to be spot on. If you understand what I'm saying, I want it to be uh, something that you can gravitate to. You know what, what I mean? You're telling me what are you telling me, Heath, is you don't want to sound like Dick Van Dyke. Thank you. I want to sound <laughs> like I was actually. I'm in South London. Like as we speak, this is where I was. Res- I mean, I'm around this. Every- I want to. F- I want. I want the listener and, and the audience to feel that this is an authentic character. When I, you know, when I do New York, when I I do a lot of, I do a lot of thug types, like criminal types, like gangsters, you know, when I'm, when I'm a New York, I never lived in New York. Are you kidding me over here? You know what I mean? I have to be able to embody those characters in a real authentic way or no one's ever going to buy it. No one's going to believe it. And if I, if I'm doing, if I go from RP to Cockney to Irish to Scottish in one in one show where I'm playing multiple characters, every one of them has to be believable on their own. They have to be able to stand alone. And so that's something that I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly striving to get better at. I constantly work on dialects. I constantly have conversations as I'm, as I'm exercising or going on my hikes or whatever I'm going fishing, whatever I'm doing, I'll have full conversations from a couple of blokes, you know, it'll be a couple of dudes that I don't know why I'm doing it. I just I'll I'll have conversations so that I'll know that if any particular line comes up in dialogue, I won't be like, oh, shit, how do I say that? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, let me go look that up or let me call my buddy and see how he do it or what. You know what I mean? So it's a it's a process and it's a never ending process. A lot of us have a mentality to always be learning. You never know everything. You you, never you're never done. There's, There's no finality there's no end to this journey right there's just ebbs and flows sometimes you're high sometimes you're low you got to stay even through it all because if you don't that's how you go crazy that's how you fall off that's how you end up in rehab you know what i mean so so i stay even and and i yeah i'm very emotional i always have been yeah so it's a it's a you always have to be fully invested fully engulfed in what it is you're doing and as we're always learning always growing with no end in sight because oh when i make it when i make it that doesn't exist that's in your mind how are you gonna how are you gonna make it give me your give me your definition of making it what you signed to a major label so what they'll never release your album you is that making it no making it is the progress you make along the way It's the journey that's making it five years ago. I would never be in a position right to where I'm at right now, but I wasn't just going to get here just because I wanted to be here. I had to work and work and work and work and I'm still working. I'm constantly working to get better and we have to be, we have to be expanding. We have to be staying current because 
times change and and the way delivery uh, occurs changes certain programming that was popular say you know gi joe masters universe uh transformers looney tunes all the stuff well looney tunes is the exception because they just kind of get to keep reinventing the same stuff and be great i love those guys um but it's changed over the years i can't be like battle cat to action you know or my have the power do you you want the scary thing is though Heath? all the stuff's uh, come back (laughs) yes yes. hey everything just goes full circle it's a few years ago i went into a toy shop i was waiting to pick my one of my friends up uh from work and it was Toys R Us when Toys R Us still existed. Mm-hmm. And I'd not been in for years and years. And I thought, I'll just have a wander around. And as I'm looking around the store, I thought, <laughs> my God, everything in here is either pretty much where I remember it being, or it's the it's literally just a modern take on what I, I mean, Transformers, I was gravitating to, but it's like, yeah. like yeah. Thundercats is still about? Man. Thundercats, Thundar the E-Man. Barbarian. <laughs> hey, listen, I when I was a kid, I collected toys. I was a I was a big fan of G.I. Joe, Masters Universe, Transformers. I had all the stuff, had all the DVDs, everything. So as I got older, when I got well, when I got to the point where my where I had my first son, I gave him all my entire collection. I mean, I had stuff in there, man. I had every Star Wars figure that was not a, like a custom build. Um, no vehicles, accessories and stuff, but I had all the figures. I had every Masters Universe figure. Come to find out, Beast Man, out of the package, is still worth like 80 bucks. Wow. But I have, no, I have no idea what my kid did with all that stuff. But I loved collecting. And as, as an adult, and I'll send you a picture of this too, I... um. I started a new collection of Masters figures, um, from Origins to Vintage to to uh, Revelation, the Kevin Smith property that's on well, Netflix now, which I really, love. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I actually wasn't sure about that, and then I got into it, you know, I think an episode yeah. two in, and I was like, yeah, I can see this, I can enjoy it. And the voice was brilliant, and for me, yes, the big thing I absolutely again was, love it. was hearing Hamill. As Skeletor, uh, yes. Just brilliant. fantastic. And I figured that Mark got the job for Skeletor, so they wouldn't be looking for me for that. But I figured if 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 they're and now they've got another a new one coming, and it's on my bucket list, but I can't get a hold of these guys. And my agents, like they um the way they cast it, they do it kind of like friends and just their close yes. circle. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't get to my agencies. And I, I've been putting it out in the universe for a year or more. I've got the entire mm-hmm. collection. I'm a huge fan of the of the property all the way back to 82. Um, the mini comics that are I do a podcast where we talk about Masters of the Universe like I love Masters of the Universe and the new the revelation I think is so beautifully written and it's so vibrant uh, animated by powerhouse animation who I love. They did Castlevania and Blood of Zeus also on Netflix, both of those. Um, phenomenal anime style animation, right? And mm-hmm. well, not quite, and it's more advanced, like more yeah. action based, but it's kind of lends a little bit to anime. But um, there, it's phenomenal. And I've been trying. <laughs> listen, I'm gonna put this on your out here, out in the UK too. I am trying to be a part of Masters Universe. It's my, it's on my bucket list, man. I it's like one of those things that I just would love to be on. I think you should be in it. I think you'd be very good. I'm intrigued though on the Hordak. new Master of the Universe to digress slightly, but I'm I'm intrigued. <laughs> Shatner's gonna be in it. Who do you yes. think he's gonna play? You know what? I have no idea. No, um unless Other he's gonna that. unless they're gonna bring like Gwildor back from the from the movie, from the Dolph Lundgren movie. <laughs> the you know, the little key maker. <laughs> I, I can't think of anyone they've ca- ran all the elder cast mm. is cast. Right. Randor um, is played by uh, Diedrich Botter, I believe. Yes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe it'll be like one of Orko's. Uh, no, all of Orko's people are dead. I don't know. I have no idea, but I'm very intrigued to find out. All I want to know is who's who's Hordak, because that's the only big villain yeah. left that they have. Yeah. Could it be him? I don't think so. You don't think- Can you picture Shatner as. <laughs> As like the lead what, villain. Depends how, <laughs> depends how they're doing it. He has played a villain. He did a turn as Two Face in, but it was the like a Batman sixty six right, right style film. 
So I don't know, man. Could be very interesting. You don't understand, Skeletor. <laughs> but here's the thing. I think I want to take over the universe. Any objections? Like he's so he's so overly dramatic and his cadence is so great and bizarre. Just like walking. Like I all voice oh, actors walking, can do walking really. impressions, but I can't. All I can do is oh, like hey, <laughs> hey, oh. Like I don't, you know, I can't I I guess if I worked on it really hard, but I'm not an impressionist. Like I, I've booked stuff off of bad impressions. So we have this theory that bad impressions are just new characters, great characters, by the way. Um, so <laughs> I booked a video game just recently off a really bad impression, and I just signed the NDA, so I can't talk about it. But uh, okay, that's fine. it is so when right. I can, when I can, I'll tell you. It was my audition was a really bad impression, and they loved it. It was over the top. It was crazy. It was. It was uh, ex exactly what they were looking for. But uh, I digress. I'm not an impressionist. So I I like to uh, I like to embody people's characteristics. Like I'll impersonate a characteristic, but it'll but I'll make it mine. Um, and I just don't I, I don't know, man. Shatner, not as Hordak. I, I hope not because I want to be Hordak. I just I, well, I it's going to be you. great, whatever he does. I could see you doing Hordak. But I wanted to also ask you, Heath, because obviously you have done both the voiceover work, you've done work, and I, I will get on to ask you about video games work as well. But you've also done live action uh, yes, work. Yes, I have. You've been in film. So what is the big difference? I always, I mean, I know there'll be a difference, but what I want to know is how does the audition process work for a voiceover against the audition process for live action? Okay. Um, stage is the most different from both of the other two genres. Live acting and voice acting are more similar than you would think. Because in live mm -hmm. acting, it picks up everything. Like the microphone picks up everything. So you have to be understated more so than reaching the back of a theater audience, right? So in theater, we're taught to project. We're taught to reach the person on the back row of the balcony. So if I'm doing a line, I have to deliver it like this. Hello, back there. Yes, yeah, imagine, I see you. Imagine, Welcome. Imagine there's a deaf person right at the back, a deaf old lady at the back of the theater. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's really what they tell you to do. But in you know, in voice acting, I'm talking to you just like I would talk to you if you were in the same room with me, or. You know, it depends on the scenario. Video games, we do a lot of different range of stuff from talking regular to whispering. We got to get really quiet sometimes and really get our point across. And other times we got to yell. Sorry, <laughs> listeners. Um, but you do. Because how many of you have played, uh, you know, like any modern warfare, Call of Duty? You got, OK, all right, we're going to surround these guys and we're going to hit them from all sides. Hey, Junior. Send that ATV off the red. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. there's, it goes back and forth. And then the efforts, which is a whole other ball game, and you hope to do those at the end of the session because they tend to destroy your throat. You know, like, uh, uh, yeah. like take, uh, I'm taking damage. Uh, uh, I'm dying over here. You know, you got to do all, <laughs> you got to do all these different things. But um, the difference for me for on camera was, it was very subtle. My my on camera experience has been awesome, um, not as extensive as I'd like it to be, and nothing primary. So not, you know, I don't talk a lot in the movies and and projects I've been a part of. I was slated to be the primary of a show that was being produced called uh, Shooting Star about a kid that sold his soul to the devil to become a famous musician, and then I play both the devil and the kid. It was a pretty cool role, um, where. It, it's kind of hard to explain, but it never came to be like uh, it fell apart. Um, but in silence, the movie I'm in with Michael Madsen, I'm, you know, I'm just a background actor. So I'm really there for scenery and not for my vocal prowess. But if I were to talk, it would be just like this, because you've got those this Sennheiser 416 that I use in my studio for promo and commercial and a lot of work is what they is like the boom mic that they have on top of their, you know, on the top of their uh machinery on their rigs and it it picks up everything and you don't need to be overly crazy with it um so i guess to, a long way of answering your question is 
there are similarities. The audition process for voice acting is usually they send you, maybe you might get a picture if it's a character role. Um, if it's, let's just assume for the sake of this conversation, we're talking about character auditions only. Yeah. So if for a voice acting audition, you, you might get a picture. You'll get probably three or four sides, which is three or four paragraphs of dialogue. And maybe efforts. Efforts is <laughs> what we talk about, like, you know, grunts, uh, eff- efforts. You know, I'm running, I'm panting, I'm out of breath, I'm throwing something, I'm taking a hit, I'm taking damage, I'm dying. So uh, whatever level that you want to do with that. So with the audition, it's really important so that it's not monotone, so your audition doesn't all sound, each side doesn't sound the same, to take a feeling and assert it to each side. So say the first side is, um, hey, men gather around. Say it's like a like a an old knight's tale or something, and you're telling. And the first side is you you're gathering the men and you're basically bringing a call to arms and you're about to go into battle. Okay, so the first side would be, say as written, it'd be, hey men, this is our time. We're here for one purpose. I'm ad living obviously because I don't have a script in front of me. Mm-hmm. And but the, but the delivery would be men gather around. We are here for a reason. You and I on the same team, a same cause. Now, let me lead you on the battlefield. Let me take your will and make it my own. And as you're building up, you're, you know, you're getting more bolsterous and you're talking because you're talking to a a big, maybe a courtroom full of people. But then the next scene, maybe the next line, and you don't know this from looking at it. This just comes from experience. Right. So the next line is maybe. um, uh, Damn it, my blade is stuck. This ice won't release or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. so maybe that's an internal thought. And you're feeling like you now you're in the midst of battle. <sighs> damn it. My blade is stuck. It's the damn ice. <sighs> I can't release my blade or whatever. Right. So you're you're working through the scenes and giving it different feelings to show range. And then maybe the next one is <laughs> you think that you can scare me with your simple tricks and swords. You know, your conjuring of what you know what I mean? So you just have to. And then and the and the the script isn't going to tell you that you just have to play. Right. You have to bring your sense of play to the role. And once you get that in front of you, how you deliver it is how you deliver it. And then hopefully you'll you'll give so much range that the director will have no choice but to at least see you again. Um, auditioning for an on camera role was really about my presence. I am um, I'm a big dude. I'm six one two fifty. Um, so I'm a pretty large man. And for the one role that I did in retribution, I was a, uh, my title in the role is actually Alexi's goon. So it was, I was part of the Russian mob and I was just a, basically like a big old goon. I would stand behind the boss with my arms crossed and just kind of look around, uh, you know, at everyone suspiciously, make sure no one's trying to do nothing, you know, Hey, what? What are you doing? You need to back up. <laughs> like, you know, that type of stuff. Nothing, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. nothing major, just a goon. Right? I love playing a goon. That's all right. It's a different thing. But uh, but then for like uh, the Madsen film, Silence, it was just, you know, we're looking for people with different body types to fit into this funeral procession scene and uh, come, you know, I was just at the right place at the right time and the right connection to get me the opportunity. Um, and I didn't have to say anything. So none, nothing else mattered. I, I had a, I had a big, uh, presence, not terrible on the eyes and it worked out. Um, I think that the problem with on camera is because it's so much to do with your looks and mm. physical presence, um, you lose track of who you are with voice acting. There's, there is no, you know, if I'm, if I need to wink, if it's like a wink, wink moment. I have to relay that through vocal affectation. I can't relay that through a wink with my eyes because no one's looking at me. Right. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're pondering instead of, you know, putting your finger on your forehead and kind of rubbing your brow and going, Hmm, you would, you would literally get on the microphone. Hmm. 
Well, that's interesting. But it's a it's an internal dialogue. So even though I'm saying it out loud, it comes across as he's saying this to himself. Um, so it's really just a matter of being able to uh, use your use your artistic brain and your mind to imagine the scenery, imagine the circumstance, imagine how you feel in the moment as that character and deliver accordingly. We all have dipped in our energy where it goes up and down, but obviously when you're doing voiceover work, when you're doing re those recordings, you're going to be expelling an awful lot of energy because you're working yourself up to, to, to doing the, the, the recording, <laughs> the voice, and it could sometimes assume just be you with a microphone. Um, how do you keep all your energy levels up throughout your enthusiasm going? I'm psycho. No, um, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> I've never really had an issue with energy. Um, I'm pretty energetic, especially when it comes to things I'm passionate about. So I have to bring that, but sometimes energy needs to be contained also. So in like in those quiet villainous moments that we were talking about earlier with Lord Terhar, when I'm calculating and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm being sinister, I don't have to exert a lot of energy to do that. Now when I'm being, a, but when I'm a soldier or something like of that nature, it's a lot of energy to be exerted and hopefully the session will uh, it'll work to where all the big energy stuff is done at the same time. And then the, you know, the off shot dialogue would be done at a different time or first versus last or whatever. But um, really the way that I maintain my focus and my energy is by knowing what I want out of this life. Like I think that if you know what you want and you've put in the work to get into the position to make it a reality, you don't all of a sudden be like, damn, I only got three hours of sleep last night. There's no way I'm bringing it today. Because what the hell were you working so hard for? You can catch up on that sleep later, right? And in music, we had a mentality. You could sleep when I'll sleep when I'm dead, which is really unhealthy and not advice I would give to anyone. But as artists, we do what is necessary to, to A, get there, and B, to maintain it. Once you get there, that's not making it. That's when the hard work actually starts. Staying relevant is probably the hardest thing in the world as an entertainer to do. Getting there could happen to anyone, but maintaining it, that requires training, focus, um, you know, being able to be vulnerable, being able to be, to live vicariously through other people. And I've always been able to do that. I've always been able to put on a front, like if I needed to appease to a certain section in the room or if I needed to make someone feel better, I know how to do that. I know how to communicate. I know how to um, relay emotion and feeling. And that has helped me more than probably anything. Musically, sure, I can understand tones and pitch and all that kind of stuff. And if I'm getting a line wrong, then I can get what's called a line reading. And the director can be like, no, I want, I want you to say it like this. Johnny, get away from the window. And maybe I was saying, hey, Johnny, get away from the window, right? But now I know musically, na 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 right? That's from music. So, hey, Johnny, get away from the window. So now I can give the director exactly what they asked for because I can read the notes that they gave me. Um, and that's where music has come into play. Uh, just, you know, if, if you're doing what you love doing, you should never – be in a position where you need to make an excuse for yourself because there are no excuses and you know that you learn that as the journey continues because you're fighting obstacles every day oh man my system crashed oh well you better get it fixed you got stuff to do oh man all these pops and clicks i can't do this i can't do that i can't 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 is not in my vocabulary i maybe i can't back. i can't wait back. to go get some, yeah yeah when you mentioned that, stuff not working, I thought straight back to our earlier conversation where we talked about the echo problem I'd had that I had to resolve. <laughs> yes, yes. But but you you resolved it, right? Yeah. Because it's not about the problem. It's about the solution. And that's true in life as well as art. No one's going to listen. No one cares about how bad my day has been. No one cares that I'm on the brink of divorce. No one cares. You know what I mean? No one cares yeah. that I was in a car accident. I mean, maybe they care. But they'll care after we're done with what we need to do, right? So you have to be able to push everything aside, get into the moment, 
and deliver what you've promised and what you've told everyone for years. Hey, I promise if I get the opportunity, I'm going to deliver. I just want to get in the room. Well, guess what, Heath? Now you're in the room. You have to deliver. And there's no excuses. And that's just how I look at it. Now, that perfect leads into a question I have, which is we talk about opportunity, talk about being in the room. So if you could be involved in the making of anything previously, a previous project and a future project, what would those dream things have been? Um, we've already talked about one. Masters of the Universe is, mm-hmm. lives in my heart. And again, I'll send you footage of my collection. Uh, <laughs> I'm punching, quite, you can't see, but I'm punching the air for that one. It's quite wonderful, actually, if I do say so much. I even have Castle Grayskull. But uh, anyway, I digress. Um, I would love, I would have loved to have been in any number of things, any Star Wars property, any Marvel property, any DC. I'd love to play Dark Side. I would oh, kill yes. to play Dark Side, right? Michael Ironside played him beautifully uh, a long time ago, Indeed. and I don't know who did him in the in the film. I don't even know if he spoke in the film. Um, it was an Eng- and, English guy, I think, on, who did just uh, the ju- Sn- the Justice League films. Yes, in the Snyder film. Escapes me, I'm afraid. Yeah, the Snyder cut. The Snyder cut. Uh, but uh, I would love to play Dark Side. I'd love to be a Transformer. I'd love to be. I'd love to be a Gobot man. Who am I kidding? I'd love to be. A, <laughs> I, 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 the Gobots. I would be. I'd love to be like in a Thundar the Barbarian type thing. I'd love to be in an Adult Swim thing because my voice lends more to realism than the whimsical, right? Mm. Um, but my bucket list is long. It's long. I'd love to be in any superhero property, anything made by Lucas Arts. I'm da- I'm down for. Um, you know, uh, big major commercials, regional commercials. My bucket list is way too extensive, but. Some of the things that I'm into, you know, I'm into all the geekdom, all the everything you'll find at Comic-Con. I'm into it. I'm into Naruto. I'm into um, Ninja Scroll anime, uh, Ghost in the Shell, D- Dungeons and Dragons. I'm into Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, I work out characters on a podcast with a bunch of other Dungeons and Dragons players, which is a lot of fun. It's like a low budget version of uh, Critical Role. Um mm-hmm. I work through a lot of voices with that. You know, I've got my, I got my orc for Dungeons and Dragons. He's, he's a big guy and he's got tusks that come out of the bottom of his mouth like this. And it makes it a little bit harder for him to articulate, you know? <laughs> so, he but then I've also, <laughs> you're right. He drools a lot, but I've also got like, you know, the little, the little thief, this guy, you know, he's, you know, he's a little timid and, and he's kind of socially awkward, but, um, you know, he, he, he can steal with the best of them. Uh, you know, I just, I work, I just work through them, you know, and, and if it doesn't work, okay, well, you were fun, pal. And I toss him and then I move on to the next guy. I might even let the DM kill the character off if I don't like, <laughs> if I don't like the way he's being played. Right. Hey, just kill him off. I'm done with that guy. But I had this one guy, his name was Arizin. His name was A-R-I-Z-E-N. So Arisen was what I was thinking, like he was rising from the dead. He was a great warrior. And I kind of gave him like a Thor, like a Thor affectation. He was he was quite brawny and bold. And I, I love to fight. Oh, give me some mead. You know, he's that guy. He's the guy in the bar that's toasting everybody and then going out and mm-hmm. kicking ass. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm into... <clears throat> I'm into video game. I'm into all video games. Uncharted, uh, you know, Valhalla, um, God, uh, God of War, uh, you know, Assassin's Creed, um, Mortal Kombat. Uh, you know, I'm kind of old school Tomb Raider. I'm kind of old school from the fact that you know I'm a kid. Of, I'm a kid of the '80s, to be honest, and. Uh, you know, but they didn't have great video games in the eighties, but once PlayStation came out, they started making some cool games, man. So like all that whole genre of excellence, war games, first person shooters. Um, I'm into movies. I'm into zombies. I'm into everything you can think of, man. I just love it all. Like I, there's something I can find that I enjoy in every piece of it. Well, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Absolutely wonderful thing. So I was going to say, I mean, you kind of already answered it, saying you, you want to work on Lucas. Uh, 
kind of Lucas projects, but if there's anyone you could work with in the future, if there's any, uh, so a fellow actor, let's look at it that way. If there's a fellow voice actor you could work with. Who would it be? Oh man, that list is extensive. <clears throat> oh dear. I'll so, it, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I throw you. Good, no, I not a curveball because I have, I have an answer for you. <laughs> I do have okay. answers for all this stuff. Um, some of my heroes and mentors in the voiceover game have already expressed to me that they'd love to work with me. So they're at the top of my list. Top of my list includes Steve Bloom, mm-hmm. uh, um, Maurice LaMarche, Jess Harnell, um, Charlie Adler, who's a, a director I'd love to work for also. Um, <clears throat> uh, Frank Welker, uh, Peter Cullen, yeah. um, man, there's so many, gosh, uh, Rob Paulson, uh, Christian Lance, um, Eric Bauza, Bob, Ber- Bob Bergen, um, I almost called him by his given name, which is Bob Berger. Um, <laughs> um, man, just, I love voice. See, that's the thing about this community, man. Everyone is so welcoming. To, if I didn't say Steve first, I meant to say Steve first. So I, I'm, I think I did, but I'm not sure. Um, Everyone in this business is so welcoming and so kind and, and John DiMaggio. And if you've got, if you've got the tools, man, if you put in the work and you're humble and you're uh, someone that people want to be around and want to talk to, you've got an infectious personality and in a good way, I don't mean like the negative way, um, then this business will, will welcome you and, and, and surrounds you with love and and information to tool yourself for the road ahead. I told you early on, I, I don't know if it was off mic or on mic, but I told you that I would leave your listeners with some uh, uh, some steps that they could take today to get into this field. And and this is for you as well as your listeners. There's a website by a great mentor of mine named D. Bradley Baker who is the voice of all the clones in the clone wars and in the bad batch. Um, he usually plays a lot, all the creature sounds that you hear that aren't Frank Welker are probably D he's got a website and that website is, I want to be a voice actor.com. And if you go there, there is literally step-by-step instructions on how to get into the business, how to find an agent, how to get a demo. I'm not in that order because you get a demo before you get the agent, but how to get into the business, how to start finding ways to practice, equipment upgrades, the whole nine from start to finish. It's like it's really a, a step by step guide. There are books like Voice Over Voice Actor by Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt, who are amazing actors. He plays Spider Man in the uh, PlayStation 4 video game series, among a billion other things. Um, there is Debbie Derryberry has a, a book out. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have the title. Rob Paulson has a book called Voice Lessons. Um, and then there's this beautiful, beautiful thing on YouTube called VO Buzz Weekly. It's the only YouTube show. It was the well, let me say it's not it's not the only anymore, but it was the first show on YouTube that was solely uh, solely directed at voice acting. And every voice actor you could ever imagine, Jim Cummings, uh, Fred Tattashore, and these are all guys I want to work with, too. So I'm just thinking of them as I go. There's so many. James Arnold Taylor, uh, you know, agents, managers, casting directors, Andrea Toyas from Blizzard, who had put the cast together for some of the greatest video games that have ever been made. Warcraft, uh, World of Warcraft, Diablo, stuff like that, right? Um just all these guests and all they do is they talk about this business, what it took for them, what it still takes to this day, things they see. And the common theme, the thing that really stuck with me, and this is true for my mentorship with Steve and with Jess and with people like Everett Oliver and anyone I could mention, they all live with an attitude of gratitude. So even if they're having a shitty day, they find a way to be grateful in those shitty moments, right? So when I learned to live with an attitude of gratitude, everything turned, everything shifted for me. All the negativity that the music business had garnered, all the negativity that I felt in my soul from what I had experienced for decades in the music business, it all just washed away in a sea of gratitude, being thankful for just for just being here. 
being thankful for, oh, wow, I'm in Seattle. It's never sunny, but it's sunny this week. I'm not going to complain that it's 90 degrees because I've been asking for the sun. I'm just grateful to be in a space. I'm grateful to wake up every day and have auditions in my inbox. I'm grateful on the, I'm really grateful on the days that I have jobs, but I'm also on grateful on the days that I don't. Um, you know, every audition you do isn't going to turn into a job. That's why the audition is the job. We treat the audition like that's the job. We give that everything we got and we send it off into the ether and we forget about it. We move on to the next one. Oftentimes, and I can't even tell you how many times this has happened. I shoot off an audition and forget all about it <clears throat> like I'm supposed to. And then six months later, I'll get a note saying, hey, the you know this project, they're interested in you. Uh, well, I was like, wait, I got to go back and find the audition. I don't even remember what I did. You know, <laughs> and that happens all the time. I've heard that but from people, other it, people as well. Yes, because, I mean, that's what happens when you do it, do the thing and forget it, because if you dwell on the audition and you don't get feedback generally, unless it's like an indie director or something, you don't get feedback on an audition that you didn't book. OK, so you should just need to get used to not hearing anything at all and moving on. Otherwise, you're sitting around going, oh, gosh, did they like it? Did I do it right? Did I do the wrong thing? Did I? You're second guessing yourself. And then that imposter syndrome kicks in and you're like, I'm not good enough. What am I even doing here? Nah. And then you start questioning your existence. Well, the best way to not do that is do the audition, send it and forget it. Hmm. And then if you hear back, it's a bonus, man. The, if the audition is the job, then the gig is just icing. That's a very, very good way of looking. Very good. I think it's a very good way you've just said. It's a very, very good attitude for life in general. It really is. It certainly is. So if we can, I tell you, I love this heap because not only if you told me about you, your life, the whole process work, but you probably, I'd say for the, for the listeners, you've given us a, a positive frame of mind and attitude to look at look at life in general. I've taken your time, so I want to start wrapping up, and I'm going to ask you. Do you have any future projects or events you would like to promote or mention? Absolutely. I, um, I've got a few things that I can promote right now that are out and available. I've got, uh, I'm on a video game called the killer gin and the killer gin arcade battle pack. I play the village elder in the killer gin. I play the orc slave in killer gin and I play general steel. Who's like the, you know, the leader of the army, you know, this guy, this is the general steel voice. But, uh, and then in the battle pack, I play uh, a character named Tejeda, um, which is not out yet, but it'll be on stream soon. I, uh, I have a project that I'm currently working on that we are promoting. And I think that the production company is doing Kickstarters and things for it. It's another independent project out of Seattle that I'm working on called American Kintsugi, where I play Roadblock. He's a villain of just basically, uh, you know, I was talking about him a little earlier. He's the guy that got burnt up. He was a fighter pilot that got burnt to a crisp. They added mechanic mechanisms to him and they started to corrupt him. And now he's a villain. Um, that's that's in the works. I am on the trailer for the brand new, the brand new uh, Among Us VR. So Among Us is a Ooh. is a game that was very, very, very popular, and yes. they've and they're coming around now to making a VR version of it. So my my looping group got together and we did all the voices for the trailer, and that was a blast. That's available to check out right now on on YouTube and whatnot, and wherever uh, they're advertising. I am uh, the voice match for Lionel Richie in the the general car insurance commercials. Um, wow. I, all I do, all <laughs> I do is I've been alone with you inside my mind. So basically, I just sing. <laughs> oh, that's wow. all. I, that's all. That's all I do on the spot. But that's that's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's another one of those roles, man. Where I was like, man, I just, I don't even think I should audition for this. I was like, I don't know, you know, maybe they're looking for a specific kind of actor, this and that. And then I was like, wait a minute, Heath, shut up, shut up. You grew up <laughs> singing this music. You grew up surrounded by this music. You grew up idolizing Lionel Richie. Just do the audition. And I didn't think I, you know, I didn't know in a, in a heartbeat I was going to book it. And I booked it. Sometimes that's that's the ones you book. The one you're like, nah, mm. I ain't going to book this. Like this role, the, the role I can't talk about. I booked that and I was like, there's no way I'm booking off that audition <laughs> because it was so over the top and so ridiculous and such a poor impression of, of, you know, of an icon uh, that it was really like, nah, they're not going to call. 
And when I got the call, I was like, yes. Now let me go back and make sure I can do that at on on call at will for four hours straight. All right, good. We're good. Um, I'm in a wonderful co- scripted comedy podcast called the Potchkey Audio Chronicles. And it is available wherever you stream podcasts. I play Grandpa Flotsky. Um, uh, Harvey, uh, why aren't you holding my bag? He's he's this guy. He's the he's the elder statesman Jewish. He's a villain, of course, because he runs an evil corporation. But it's funny. And and Potchkey is a is a gumshoe uh, detective agency. And they are really asinine. They have no idea what they're doing and they're constantly blundering their schemes. So my job is to come in and and show them how to do it right. Right. I'm the bad guy. Let me show you how this organization, this evil organization should be run. That's available wherever you can find podcasts i am on uh i'm on a, a, a an amazing project that i love that i love dearly i've been with it since i first got into this business and i've grown with it and i've become better through the process episode one to episode 10 is night and day difference as i've grown as an actor um and as a, a, a you know a tactician of the studio and my equipment uh it's called star wars Res- i'm sorry star wars knights of the old republic resurgence uh it's on apple it's on spotify it's on wherever you listen to podcasts Podbean. um i play the narrator and i play lord tirhar the dark lord of the sith and the evil ruler of the galaxy uh, at a time just post Malik and pre Palpatine. Um, let's see what else am I on? I am on an amazing project. That's not, that's still in development called fighting all odds, which is a superhero genre, uh, animated series. I play a dual role and I can't really talk about that because it's a secret of who I'm playing. Um, I can, I can say that, I can say this. I play a father of a superhero who is a uh, who is a deaf girl who and we use American Sign Language actually in the animation. So it makes it really interesting and unique um, and inclusive. And it's beautifully written and it's beautifully cared for by the creator. Uh, actually, I had a, a a little session with him this morning. He's also an actor and sometimes actors need other actors to talk to to get some feedback and get some some, you know, some mentorship. Uh, so I'm always pleased to do those types of things. I also, I do mentor students, but I, I have a max of five. I don't, I just don't have time to take on more people than that and give them the type of time and devotion that I need to give them. Um, but I have, I currently have three students that I work with and I have a cap of five. So to, if I get two more students in the next couple months, I won't be mad at it. But if I don't, I'm not mad at that either. I'm just blessed and, and grateful for an opportunity to help shape these young actors. Um, man, I, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, my website, heathmartinvo.com, has links to stuff I've done, stuff I'm continuing to do. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And things that I will be doing. Anything that I can talk about is pretty mm-hmm. much available to find. My social medias are all the same too. So if anyone wants to follow the journey, I do a lot of stuff about fitness because I went from being 318 pounds to now I'm 250. So I talk about fitness and what that journey has been and what that entails, uh, as well as voice acting tips of the day and just general life uh, advice and and things to do there. Um, that's a big part of who I am is coaching young people and teaching young people how to survive in a world that is crazy and hell bent on destroying every one of us. Uh, <laughs> I am on, um, Oh, my music. You can get a whole, you can get all my music from my website as well. There's a link that will take you directly to my digital album called Anthony Martin AM. It's a wonderful album. If you're into R and B music, I hope you enjoy it. I hope your listeners will check it out. Um, I'm in a podcast called the Byron Chronicles, which you can find wherever you find podcasts as well as the Kyleson Chronicles. So a couple of, of other podcasts there that I'm a part of. And then my, my YouTube channel is also Heath Martin VO. And on there, you can find my entire D and D campaigns, as well as all my VO quick tips, as well as, uh, some musical stuff that I do my music video, um, 
just so much content, so much stuff for you to enjoy, man. I will just say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. It really has. And I'm going to ask one favor before we uh, we sign off. For you, is, pal, anything. It's been a real you. pleasure it's, for me, too. Thank you. And it's the, the one I always like to hear from people. And you have a wonderful, deep baritone. So the tr- the, vo- the the quintessential voice of a trailer, uh, trailer voice in a world, one man. <laughs> Yeah. And you do yep. your version of that. I, I got you. I got you. Okay. Hold on. <clears throat> In a world, one man stands against them all. Will he fight? Will he fall? Find out next time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> That's you're so brilliant. you're so welcome. <laughs> you know so, that that announcer style read isn't as popular as it was 20 years ago, but it's yeah, so much fun to do. It's brilliant, it's so, so much fun. Oh, it is. So, without further ado, I think that's always the correct term to use. Uh, this has been an episode of Talking Codswallop, melding into celluloid Codswallop. So. I think we have been talking of celluloid and just talking codswallop. So as ever, I have been James. My wonderful guest has been Mr. Heath Martin, voiceover legend. Thank you very much. (laughs) In the making, James, in the making. I will not take credit where I have not earned it yet, but I am definitely on the way to becoming a legend. And if that's how you see me, I appreciate you so much. I just want to be a value. I want to be someone that people know that they what they're what they're getting. You know, I want them to know that they're getting a certain level of professionalism, of care, of of heart in everything that I do. And if I'm not passionate about it, James, I don't do it because I can't give you something that's not authentic. Well, I think from what you've said, everything you do will be wonderful and authentic. So once again, thank you very much, sir.